Hello, dear friends, and welcome to our weekly program. Where we have been studying Genesis by Alan Kardec, and we have been focusing on the miracles. We learned a lot. We learned that there aren't really any miracles, and that that what was deemed miracles could be explained thanks to spiritism. Now we will continue our study. We will be continuing with chapter 16, which is in the third part of Genesis by Ellen Kardec. And the third part is entitled Predictions. There's three subchapters under predictions. One is chapter 16, which is the theory of foreknowledge. And then chapter 17 is the predictions in the gospel. And then chapter 18 is the time has come. So today we will be focusing on chapter 16, the theory of foreknowledge. And what we will do is not read word for word, but most of it. Then we will break it apart and we will be pulling up a little PowerPoint to support the points of interest the items that we are most focused on to give us a visual to help us understand and bring in the information deeper. So let us share here. Okay, here we go. All right. All right, friends. Genesis chapter 16. So for all of you who would like to follow along in Genesis, it is in this edition. It is page 367. Item one. How is cognizance of the future possible? How can we foretell the future? That is how Alan Kardec starts this part of the chapter. One can understand foreknowledge of events that are the consequence of things from the present state, but not those that have no relation to the present and even less those that are attributed to chance. So how can we foretell information and knowledge if they have no relation to the present and even less so when they are part of chance, when they are attributed to chance. It is said that future matters do not yet exist. Future events do not yet exist, we learn. They are still in nothingness. So how can one know that they will happen? How can we know? about future events. Nonetheless, the examples of predictions coming true are quite numerous, from which one must conclude that it involves a phenomenon for which we do not yet have the key, because there is no effect without a cause. So Alan Kardec is explaining to us that foreknowledge of events that haven't even happened yet or are events by chance, how can they be foretold? Do we have the knowledge? Is it possible? And we kind of know the answer. It is possible because how many times have we encountered that we had a foreknowledge moment, premonition, how many times have we contacted psychics and they have foretold us things? How many times have we read books about it, had sessions, read about it on social media? And then a lot of these predictions are really quite correct and, and really be, become true. And Alan Kardec is underlining our experience by saying there really is no effect without a cause. So there has to be a cause. There has to be a reason why foreknowledge is possible. 
We like the logic, the scientific approach that Alan Kardec brings to the matter. So now, of course, our next question is, what is the cause of foreknowledge of the future? If we know that there must be a cause, now we want to know what is the cause. It is this cause that we shall attempt to discover. And once again, it is spiritism, itself the key to so many mysteries, will show us that even the phenomenon of predictions is not outside natural law. So here too, we do not have a miracle. There is no mystery about it. It's very logical. Every effect has a cause. We've all experienced foreknowledge being foretold made predictions, we have experienced predictions, we have experienced foreknowledge. So there has to be a cause and we will be learning about it. This is really exciting. So let us see. For comparison, let us take an example from everyday matters, which will help us to understand the principle that we are going to develop. So what have we learned so far? Yes, there is a way to foretell the future. Even if it hasn't so-called happened yet and appears to be by chance. There is no effect without a cause. We will be finding out what the cause is of this foreknowledge. And we are already understanding that this phenomena of foreknowledge or prediction is within the natural law. It has to be cause and law. The law of cause and effect predicts that postulates that, makes that clear to us. So now let us use an example that Alan Kardec um, pulls in to make it clear to us of what actually mechanically happens in foretelling the future. And this is a beautiful example that will really help us understand it. So let us imagine a man up on a high mountain observing the vast expense of the plane. In this circumstance, the distance of one league would seem very small. And in one glance, this man could easily take in all the different features of the terrain from the beginning to the end of the road. The traveler who is taking this road for the first time knows that as he sets out, he will reach the end, a simple foreknowledge of the result of his journey. So if we imagine ourselves high up on a mountain and we're looking down into a valley and we see all the details, yes, from afar, so we don't see close up exactly all the minutest details, but we're seeing from the mountain to the distance and we know that if somebody was walking along there, yes, that would be, that's where they would reach. Right? So we because we see once we're up high, we can see so much more of the terrain. We get an overview. The traveler who is taking this road for the first time knows that he sets out, he will reach the end. A simple foreknowledge of the result of his journey. Right? So if we're high up on the mountain and we see, okay, down this valley to the next mountain, we know how the road goes. We know exactly that we walk along there. This is our goal. We will reach it. However, the features of the terrain, the ups and downs, the rivers and, and forests to cross, the precipice into which he might fall, the thieves that might rob him and the inns where he might spend the night, all of this is external to him because from up high this traveler would not be able to see all the minutest details so-called vicissitudes of life they would not be available to this traveler it is the unknown the future because his sight does not extend beyond the small area that's around wait do we hold on just a second external yes it is the unknown the future because this side does not extend beyond the small area that surrounds him as for the amount of time it will take he measures it by how long it will take to travel the road take away his points of reference and the amount of time disappears for the man watching the traveler from the top of the mountain all this is the present however 
So if somebody's down in the valley, they will be in the middle of it all. They won't see the end point. For them, every valley, every robber, every precipice, every tree, every forest is going to be an experience they can't look beyond. For them, time exists. However, for the traveler who is high up on the mountain, he can look right down to the beginning of the valley and he can look to the end of the valley. There's no time difference. You see what, what we're saying, what Alan Kardec is telling us? Because all of this is being seen at the same time. So this is important. So for the man watching the traveler from the top, the one who is down in the, in the valley, the man who is up on top watching this one in the valley, all this is the present. Okay. Now let us imagine that this man goes down to the traveler and says to him, at such and such a moment, you will meet with such and such a matter. You will be attacked and then rescued. He will be predicting the future. At this moment, this man who is coming down the mountain, who has seen the overview and is giving the traveler who is down in the valley more information, will have predicted the future. For the traveler, it is the future. For the man on the mountain, it is the present. Beautiful, isn't it? Doesn't that help us understand how the mechanism of foreknowledge, telling the future, foretelling the future works? When we're up high, we have an overview. We can see to the end point, and it's in the present moment. There is no linear time as we know it. The traveler who is in the valley, that's us on this earth, for us, it is time. Every step takes time. And do we know what's beyond the next valley? Do we know what's beyond the next forest? No, we don't. But if this traveler from on high comes down and says, hey, wait a minute, you know, then and then you will encounter this and this, he will have foretold us the, the future for us, which for this traveler is not the future. Because from this vantage point of the traveler on high, it's all present. All right. Um, please hold all your questions. Once after a while, we will double check and see, because I can't see you right now and any questions, um, but we will be checking it, all right? So now we're moving on. Now, if we leave the sphere of purely physical matter, and if through our thought we enter the realm of the spirit life, we will see the same phenomena occurring on a large scale. So this whole mechanism that we just learned about, same thing happens when we, you know, from the spirit world to us. Dematerialized spirits are like the man on the mountain. Space and length of time do not exist for them. However, the extent and penetration of their sight are proportional to their purification and their level in the spirit hierarchy. Let us pause. Let us take that apart. So the dematerialized spirits, the more pure spirits, and the pure, the more they are higher up, like this man on top of the mountain, having a wider view. Dematerialized means less attached to matter, more pure. Space and length of time do not exist for them. These spirits that are more on high, they're more purified, more developed. For them, time and length of time and space do not exist. Because remember that travel up on top of the mountain could see far and wide. And it's all at the same moment. However, the extent and penetration of their sight, so how much they see and how precise they see, events are proportional to their purification. So the more purified a spirit is, the more they will see and know. 
In comparison to low order spirits, they are like persons armed with powerful telescopes alongside those who have only their naked eyes. So the more dematerialized and the more purified a spirit is, the stronger of a telescope they have, so to speak, compared to the lower order spirits who only have their so-called naked eyes. Among the latter, namely the lower order spirits, the range of sight is limited not only because they can only with difficulty detach themselves from the globe to which they're connected, but also because the coarseness of their parish, their spirit veils far off things. In the same way that fog hides them from the eyes of the body. So the lower order spirits, because of the density of their parish spirit, and because they're more connected they're still more material, will not be able to see as much. It's like a fog that clouds their spirit vision. And we can very much relate to that because we are in the flesh, we are in the physical form, we are in matter, and we all deal with this fog, right? One can therefore understand that according to its degree of perfection, a spirit can envision a period of few years, a few months, a few centuries, or even several thousand years. For what is one century in the face of the infinite? As we always learn, every lifetime is but a blink of the eye in the greater scope. Before such a spirit, events do not unroll sequentially like the incidents along the traveler's route. Rather, it sees the beginning and the end of the time frame all at once. Remember? The view from on high. All the events which during this time frame comprise the future for people on earth are the present for the future. Let us pause. So, Dematerialized spirits are just like the man high up on the mountain. The more dematerialized, the more purified the spirit, the higher they're up, the bigger the scope is of their vision. It's if they had a very strong telescope. Space and length of time do not exist for them. All events happen at the same moment. Only for those travelers that are down in the valley and are lower order spirits, events unroll sequentially. There's a beginning and the end. For the dematerialized spirits, that is not the case. The case. The lower order spirit side, spirit side is limited due to, due to the coarseness of their peri spirit and the attachment to their globe. All right, so let us continue. Consequently, it will be able, the spirit will be able to tell us assuredly, the higher order spirit, such and such thing will happen at such and such time because I can see the matter just as the man on the mountain can see what awaits the traveler on his journey. If it does not do so, if this higher order spirit does not do so, it is because foreknowledge of the future might be harmful. So here's an additional um ingredient for our understanding understanding high order spirits do not necessarily give us the information why because it might be harmful for us it would and why would it be harmful it would compromise our free will and it would paralyze us in the endeavor we must accomplish for our progress so so let's pause a minute. By being unknown, the good and evil that awaits them represents a trial. So higher order spirits who see vast amounts and could help us tremendously by transferring this knowledge to us don't always do so because it would take away from our free will. We need to labor for our progress. That is part of our merit. How do we learn of what is good and what is evil? We do it by trial and error, by effort and repetition, by 
building up um, experience. So we're just, um, there is question 123 in the spirits book. Let us pull this up because that's a chapter that might help us. It just came in. 123. Okay, just a second here. 123 is in part two, chapter one in the spirits book, and this one here. And um, the chapter is entitled Spirits. And here, Alan Kardec is wondering, how do people learn what distinguish good from evil? And he's wondering whether everyone has to go through the stages of ignorance and evil. And um, and, uh, and the spirit says, we, we all have free will. So yes, we need to learn by um, trial and error. And there's question 123, where Alan Kardec asks, why does God allow spirits to follow the path of evil? So now let us relate that to the higher spirits, not telling us, okay, let's turn left. No, don't do this. He, you know, then this will happen. How do we learn to not follow the path of evil? It's not the spirits on high that necessarily tell us, right? We know that from our experience. No. Why? How do you dare ask God to give account for the divine acts? Do you think you can delve into God's will? Instead, you should say that God's wisdom is found in the freedom of choice that has been granted to each spirit so that each one may have the merit of its own deeds. We learn by merit. We learn by trial and error. If we were being told all the upfront of what would happen and what we should do and what we, what we should do, I think, A, we would rebel at our stage of evolution, right? Like when we were children, when mom or dad said, don't do this because then this is going to happen. Stay away from that. That's dangerous because this may happen. And we were rebelling. We said, no, this is my life. I need to learn. That's exactly why. So the spirits on high don't necessarily hold us by the hand that much. They will not tell us. So we can exercise our free will and learn our lessons. And these trials are really the best lessons for us to learn, to distinguish, learn to distinguish what's good and what's evil. So let us see, where were we? Um, so by being unknown, the good and evil that awaits them represents a trial. If such a faculty, even though restricted, may be found among the attributes of the creature, then how much more powerful must it be among those of the cre creator who encompasses the infinite? So now he's saying, if spirits on high can already see that much, how much more infinite is the vision of the creator? For the creator, time does not exist. The beginning and the end of worlds are the present. Within this enormous panorama, what is the span of one person's life, of one generation, of an entire people? So this is really good for us to know because it also puts perspective on our lives. Sometimes we're stuck in a valley, in a, on a precipice, and we just don't know how to get out of this. It's our pickles, right? But if we look at the bigger picture, there's always a solution. And when we look even as high as the creator is God, all of these moments are just minuscule. And the time and time as we know it, this linear effect where the clock goes tick, 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 does not exist once we leave this sphere. Once our vision becomes elevated, we become less dense, we become more dematerialized, more purified, we too will experience and, and see that everything's happening at the same time. In a way, it's an illusion that we think that things are in the future or in the past. So this is really expansive, right? 
So we cannot have our free will compromise because that would paralyze us, right? So let us continue item four. Nevertheless, since human beings must cooperate in the overall progress, you know what I want to do before we continue? I want to see it, whether there's any questions, any comments. Tony is here. Hi, Tony. Hi, Nora. Hi, Flavia. So no questions yet. Feel free to, to ask because I'm kind of not in touch once I'm, I'm on the share screen mode. Okay, so I'm going to go back to sharing. Okay. Nevertheless, since human beings must cooperate in the overall progress, and since certain events must result from such cooperation, it might be useful in special cases for the spirit, higher spirits to foreknow these events in order to prepare the way for them, and so that they may be ready to act when the time comes. So there is certain specific moments, special cases where we are allowed to receive more information, to, so to say, have the veil lifted on our, on our future, what we perceive as our future. It might be useful in special cases for them to foreknow these events in order to pre prepare the way for them and so that they may be ready to act when the time comes. This is why God at times permits a corner of the veil to be lifted, but always for a useful purpose and never to satisfy vain curiosity. So this is never a game. If we go to a psychic and we want to know whether we're going to win this million dollars and they're going to tell us yes, on the 14th of December, 2032, that's when you're going to win it. I think we may want to put a question mark to, next to this, right? Because we know why now, right? So the corner of the veil only gets lifted in special cases for use for purpose, purposes. For example, when there is imminent danger or great calamities hit, when revolutions take place, and that's why, and we will read this in a moment, often persecuted sects receive this information so that they can take measures to protect themselves. We're also reminded of Christopher Columbus, who was foretold information, Joan of Arc, and there's many in the history of mankind. Therefore, such a mission might not be given to all spirits, since there are those who do not know the future any better than humans do. That's the other thing. Not every spirit even gets to know this, gets, uh, receives this information. It should be noted that revelations of this kind are always made spontaneously and never, or at least very rarely, in response to a direct request. So again, when we make a direct request, is this revolution going to happen this year? Most likely we're not going to get the answer. And if we do, we may want to put a question mark behind this, right? So we need to let the light of discernment, we need to be discerning about information of this nature as well. Just like with everything else. And this is what helps us understand how the mechanism works and what is possible and why it is possible and what's not possible and why it wouldn't be. Because God does not fulfill curiosity. It would just be to help someone in cases of great danger, great calamities, revolutions, persecuted sects might get help. Furthermore, such mission may be entrusted to certain individuals in the following manner. Without knowing about the matter, those to whom the task is given of revealing a hidden matter may receive inspiration from spirits who do know about it, and they then transmit it mechanically without realizing. So sometimes certain spirits are being sought out to get this so-called foreknowledge. 
Moreover, whether during sleep or during the waking state, as well as during ecstasies and second sight, it is known that the soul frees itself and to a greater or lesser degree possesses the faculties of a free spirit. So this information may be coming through during sleep time or maybe ecstatic ecstasies, ecstatic um, stages, uh, sometimes some, during somnambulistic experiences. Right? We learned about it several months ago. If it is an advanced spirit, and especially if, like the prophets, it has received a special mission to that effect, then during the moments of its emancipation, the soul enjoys the faculty of grasping a period of time of a greater or lesser duration. And it sees the events of that time frame as if they were in the present. So some spirits, incarnates, have this, this uh, mission in their lifetimes to guide others towards safety, <laughs> so to speak, for example, and they may receive this information. They may be granted this information to pass it on to the larger population. It may then reveal them in, in that same instant or retain the memory of them upon awakening if such events must remain secret, it will either forget them or will retain only a vague intuition sufficient to guide it instinctively. So if we look at our own lives and we're seeking some foreknowledge, maybe we will be granted that, but now we know why we wouldn't get it granted. But it may come during sleep time. And if we are granted, to retain that information, we will wake up and know about it. If not, we will have forgotten about it. But it does not only pertain to us, but of course, everyone else too. So God is wise, God is good, God is just and merciful. So that is one thing we can completely trust. So if we don't have any knowledge of the future, even though we're so desperately seeking it and we're running from door to door of psychics and who knows more, spiritist centers, we may not want to do that because if God wants us to know the future, we will find out. It is thus that we see this faculty developing providentially on certain occasions. So sometimes on certain occasions, providence allows us to get foreknowledge of the future. And this is during imminent danger, great calamities, and revolutions. And it is thus that most persecuted sects have had numerous seers. Furthermore, it is thus that we have seen great commands, advance, commanders advance resolutely against the enemy. Certain of victory, that person of genius like Christopher Columbus, for example, pursues an objective, predicting, so to speak, the moment in which they will reach it. Charles, the, um, um, what was his name? Um, no, the French revolutionary, he too. There were many actually in the history of mankind who received this foreknowledge of what exactly to do. It is because they have seen the goal which was not unbeknownst to their spirit. It's beautiful. Hence, the gift of prediction is no more supernatural than a multitude of other phenomena. When there is a cause, there will be an effect. And when we experience an effect, there was a cause. And at, right at that moment, the phenomena is not supernatural, which does not make it a miracle. It rests upon the properties of the soul and the law governing the relationship between the visible and invi invisible worlds, and which spiritism has come to make known. So the theory of foreknowledge rests upon natural law. It rests upon the law of cause and effect. And it rests on the relationship of the soul and the law governing the relationship of the soul and both incarnated as well as incarnated in its relationship in the visible and the invisible world. Perhaps this theory regarding foreknowledge does not completely resolve all the cases that the revelation of the future may involve, but it cannot help 
but be useful in that it establishes the fundamental principle. So Alan Kardec tells us it may not be inclusive, what we just learned, but it helps us understand the fundamental principle, the mechanism behind the theory of foreknowledge, the ins and outs, why it wouldn't happen and why it could happen. Quite often, whether in the ecstatic or somnambulistic state, persons in doubt with the faculty of foreknowledge see events as if they were drawn on a blackboard. So this is, this is also good to hear, right? So either in the ecstatic or somnambulistic state, spirits, persons who have this faculty can see things like on a blackboard. This may also be explained by thought photography. So we could also call it thought photography. Since it is an event in the thought of the spirits that work for its accomplishment or in the individuals whose actions should cause it, such thought crossing through space like sounds cross through air can draw a picture for the seer. We studied that in the chapter of fluids. Every thought creates a fluidic imprint and can be read by other spirits. Now, once again, while we are in the flesh, we have this veil um, over our eyes, our inner eyes and our outer eyes. So we are very often not capable of picking up on it or reading it. But once we are out of our physical form, that is how we communicate. We see the imprint of every thought in the universal cosmic fluid just like a thought photography. At that very moment, we can, we know what's going on. And of course, that can also pertain to the future. By the way, this is also often how psychics read us because these images, they're living inside of us and they're reading these, these thought photographies. All right, so where were we? However, since its fulfillment may be hurried up or delayed depending on the circumstances, the seer sees the event, but without being able to determine the exact time. So a psychic or somebody who can see these thoughts and events that are so-called happening in the future, even though we know from the vantage point, they're also, they're actually happening right now. They can be read, but not with exact dates. That's why we learned already in the medium's book that the minute the spirit comes through and gives us exact dates, we may want to look a little bit closer and um, study the message a little bit more closely because it could be a spirit who is tricking us. Sometimes that particular thought might even be only a plan, a desire that might not be fulfilled. Hence the frequent errors of fact and date involving in forecasting. Because if we go, I don't know about you, but if you've gone to a psychic, they often tell you exactly what you actually want because they were seeing the pictures, the thought photography. They can't tell us what, when and if it's gonna happen. And then we think, wow, how did they know? Well, they were reading our thoughts. Let us go back for a moment to chapter 14. Chapter 14, item 13 and following. Because then we can jog our memory a little bit. It's on page 289 in the version that I have here, which is this one. There, it's in the, in the chapter of fluids. We learned that the spiritual fluids which comprise one of the states of the universal cosmic fluid, are properly stated the atmosphere for spirits. It is the element from which they draw the matter upon which they operate. So the universal cosmic fluid, the fluids are the state for the spirits. Spirits act upon the spiritual fluids, but they do not manipulate them like humans manipulate gases. Instead, spirits use the help of thought and will. Thought and will are for spirits, that hands are for humans. 
By means of thought, they impress upon the fluids this or that direction and every thought. Then in item 15, since the fluids are the vehicle for thought, thought acts upon the fluids as sound acts upon the air. Fluids bring thought to us just as the air brings sound. Now, if somebody has the faculty to read these thoughts imprinted into the universal cosmic fluid, that's when they can tell us stuff. As thought creates fluidic images, thought creates fluidic images, it is reflected in the perispiritual envelope as in a mirror. There, it takes on a body and photographs itself, itself somehow. The thought creates the image, and the entire scenario we're thinking out is then painted like a picture within the cosmic universal cosmic fluid. So when we go to psychics, or psychics are trying to read us, they cannot see what is not yet in our thoughts because it's not imprinted in the universal cosmic fluid yet. However, if a dematerialized spirit has the vantage point, then it's a very different story. They can actually see. They can truly see. But will they tell us? Most likely not, because we need to learn to distinguish between good and evil. We need to have trials in order to learn through merit. All right, Check item eight. Okay, gift of prediction is not supernatural. The, it rests upon the properties of the soul. It rests upon the law governing the relationship between the visible and the invisible world. The foreknowledge of the future in ecstatic or somnambulistic states may be explained by thought photography. The seer sees events, but not particular times. So again, that helps us to be on the alert when somebody foretells us the future. All right, item eight. In order to comprehend spiritual matter, that is, in order to go as clear and to get as clear an idea about them as we could get of a landscape right in front of our eyes, we actually lack a particular sense, just as a blind person lacks the sense needed to comprehend the effects of light, color, sight, and so forth. So we lack this faculty of seeing that far out. Thus, it is not only by an effort of the imagination that we arrive there, but with the help of comparisons drawn from things that are familiar to us. Material things, however, can only provide us with highly imperfect ideas about spiritual things. Okay? They're much denser, which is why we cannot take comparisons literally and why we, and believe, for example, that the extent of the per perceptive faculties of spirit depends on high up, depends on high up they actually are, and that they must be on a mountain or above the clouds in order to compre comprehend time and space. So we, in other words, Alan Kardec is pointing out to us that due to our limited senses, we cannot quite comprehend of how these higher spirits, these more dematerialized, pure, more purified spirits, how they actually can, um, how they can have this faculty of seeing so much. All the comparisons we're using are kind of not doing the reality of this phenomena justice. We use this example of this traveler high up on the mountain and it helps us tremendously. But now we're learning it's not giving us the full scope of the experience, but it helps us to get closer. Such faculty is inherent, this faculty of foreknowledge, seeing the so-called future, such faculty is inherent to the state of spiritualization or rather dematerialization, meaning that spiritualization produces an effect that may be compared, although very imperfectly, to that of the full range of sight of the man on top of the mountain. So now Alan Kardec is backing up 
what he just explained to us in general terms, in specific terms. He says that this faculty of foreknowledge is linked to the purification state of the soul. The more dematerialized the soul is, which means the less attached a soul is to matter. And that is something you and I can, can work on right now by focusing on our inner transformation. We learned that in our study of heaven and hell, that the more we detach ourselves from matter, which is not just this computer and the house and the car, and the, but it's also our relationships, it's our children, it's our husbands, our wives, our family members. It is titles, it's careers, it's money, it's, it's politics, it's everything that is really happening on this planet. The more we're attached to that, the harder our discarnation will be. The harder we will be able, the less we will have a faculty of seeing the bigger picture because we're drawn, we're blinded by matter, so to speak. So he says that this faculty is inherent in the dematerialized, more purified spirits. And we are just trying to understand how they can see as much as they do and, and why by drawing this comparison to the traveler high up on the mountain, overlooking the terrain and knowing what's happening for us in the future, but for them, it's also the present. The objective of this comparison is simply to show that events that lie in the future for some lie in the present for others. And they may thus be foretold, which does not imply that the effect is produced in the same way. So for us, it is a foretelling for the dematerialized spirits. It's current. It's in the present moment. So this is a totally different experience that we don't, we can't really imagine to have our whole lifetime, let's say 60 years, however long many years you've been on the planet, to see that all as a current moment. That would be if we had a vantage point from on high. Therefore, to enjoy this perception, the spirit does not have to go to a particular point in space. So a dematerialized spirit does not have to travel, does not have to go to a specific place to have that faculty in this experience. A spirit who is at our side here on earth may possess it as fully as if it were a thousand leagues away. So space, location do not matter. Sight in spirits works neither in the same way nor with the same elements as it does in human beings. Spirit sight is very different. Again, we studied that in the previous chapters in the section of Genesis that deals with the miracles. And there we learned that spirit sight is not localized. It's not like our sight, which is literally just focused on these two dots. But spirit sight is covers the whole perispirit. It's very different. It's hard for us to imagine how it actually feels right now. Their visual horizon is entirely different. And it is precisely the sense that keeps us from conceiving it because we just don't know right now how spirit sight works. A spirit compared with an incarnate is like a sighted person compared with a blind person. So we are really blind. We have this veil of matter around us that keeps us in the dark, that keeps us in the gray. It's like a veil, it's like a curtain that prevents us from seeing more than just right, right around us, essentially. Some of us can have a little bit more of a faculty, but generally speaking, we're all in the same situation. So spirit side works differently. It's not as limited. A spirit compared with an incarnate is like a sighted person, a person that can see compared with a blind person. So if we compare ourselves with a blind person, we are the blind person right now compared to a spirit. 
So dear friends, let us pause here. We've covered a lot of territory. So we've studied today item one through eight of chapter 16 entitled The Theory of Foreknowledge. We, and we learned that spirit side is entirely different, that the more dematerialized the spirit is, the more they see. Space doesn't matter to them. What they see is all at the current moment. There is no future from their vantage point. There only exists past, present, and future for us. We also drew a comparison, thanks to Alan Kardec, of that of a traveler on high. So we understand a little bit better of how spirit sight works. And we were also told that even though there's many spirits have this vantage point and know what happens in our perceived future, they will not tell us because we need to go through the motion. We need to have those trials to be able to better discern good from evil. And we do that through merit. So, dear friends, I hope this is on some level consoling to us. I know it might also be frustrating because how much would we love to see more, right? But we can work on it by working on our inner transformation and so-called dematerializing our lives little by little. Focusing more on our spiritual faculties, doing the good and not being as attached as we may still be or have been. And this will not only help us with our better vision, but it will also help us with our final transition back to the spirit world, releasing of our physical shell. Dear friends, thank you so much for joining. We will continue with the second half of chapter 16, the theory of foreknowledge next week before we continue on. Let me get out of the sharing mode so I can say hello and goodbye to you guys. All right, here we go. Um, John, thank you so much um, for joining. So John says that explains why when we die, we see our entire former life unfold. Yeah, and then it's probably an experience of it's happening right now, right? So the whole concept of time is something we see a little bit more of how illusionary it is or how just personal this experience is to be in the flesh, to have this linear time. So this is very interesting. It's it's eye-opening. It's expansive. And there's Abed Ahmed. Thank you so much for joining too, dear friend. Thank you, everyone, for being here. And so God willing, we will see you again next week, same time, same place. God bless you. Take care.